Hey everyone, this is James from Brewing Books. So a few years back, I had a blog in which I would share my thoughts and ideas on anything related to Tolkien and his works. And in those years, I wrote a number of essays and opinion pieces about Middle Earth that were meant to stimulate friendly discussions and debate amongst like-minded Tolkien readers. So now with this uh, video platform, an opportunity has arisen to reshare those ideas. Thanks to all of you out there who keep the channel going on a day-by-day -day basis. And because of such a wonderful community of avid readers, I thought this would be the ideal time to start this discussion series, in which we tackle several Tolkien subjects along the way. Book reviews, as always, will still be uploaded. In the meantime, however, feel free to engage in these discussions. So, to start off our discussion series, so to speak, today we will try to identify and discover the origins of the ring rates. Now, there are many theories and speculations on the possibilities of who and where Sauron's greatest servants came from. To better understand their origins, we must first carefully analyze a specific period in time and cross references with different sources, trying to build a framework, as it were, along the way, and to understand the events that occurred at that point in time. Of course, everything presented here comes from Tolkien's own sources, and please do keep in mind that any form of result at the end of this speculation is ultimately just that, my own personal opinion and speculation about this hotly debated topic. Okay, so here is what we know for sure about the ring rates. Three of the ring rates were originally men from Numenor, the leader of the nine was known as the Witch King of Angma, and the second in command of the Ringwraiths was called Kamul, the Easterling. So the rest of our knowledge on Ringwraiths, besides what we find in The Lord of the Rings, is based on their characteristics and behavior. And we may find a few fragmentary references here and there in the Silmarillion and Unfinished Tales. So let's start by constructing a theory. First off, we must go through all the sources that we have at our disposal, mainly timelines and specific quotes that point towards the unknown aspects of these beings. From the Lord of the Rings, we learn that the handing out of the nine rings of power were given to great and powerful men, and it was not a case of merely distributing them at will but there was a specific strategic aspect to it as well. It was a specific political and strategic move on behalf of Sauron that would assure him future victories and control over all the lands. So let's start by considering two important dates, the creation of the One Ring and the first appearance of the Nazgul. In The Lord of the Rings, in one of the appendices, The Tale of Years, we are informed that Sauron forged the One Ring in the Second Age, circa 1600. Now, taking a few dates from the appendix, we find the following. The date around 1800, Second Age, is important because it indicates an approximate time when Sauron may have started to give out his Rings of Power. And in the Silmarillion, we are given an almost clear-cut explanation of how the ring rates came to be. Those who used the Nine Rings became mighty in their day, kings, sorcerers, and warriors of old. They obtained glory and great wealth. They had, as it seemed, unending life. In order for men to be perceived as having a longer lifespan than usual, several hundred years would probably have had to pass since receiving these rings in order to justify and explain this unnatural occurrence, especially in the eyes of other men. Therefore, with the Nazgul clearly making an appearance in 2251 Second Age, would indicate approximately that the Nine received their respective rings sometime approximately between 1600, the creation of the One Ring itself, and 1800, thereby allowing roughly 500 years for them to acquire extraordinary power and turn into wraiths. 
the darkening of Numenor and the conquering of Eriador. Having established a fairly indicative timeline to explore the beginnings of the Ringwraiths, we must look at events which occurred both in Middle-earth and on Numenor. So after the creation of the One Ring, Sauron invades Eriador and destroys Eregia. This is between 1695 and 1697, Second Age. It would take a further three years in 1700 for Tar Minastir, the then king of Numenor, to send an army to Middle-earth and defeat Sauron. Before this event, the Dark Lord would have had precious little time, a maximum of five years, to subdue some of the men he was targeting by gifting them the Rings of Power. Unfortunately, we have no evidence of any kings that surfaced from that area, but it is a definite possibility that one or two sorcerers and warriors remained hidden within the confines of Eriador until they became completely enslaved by Sauron. More on this later on. So during these events, we also have the slow uprising of the Numenorians against the ban of the Valar. What is so significant in this period of Arda's history is the sudden migration towards the western shores of Middle-earth by the Numenorians, intent on subduing the lesser men living in and around those coastal regions. The king's men sailed far away to the south, and the lordships and strongholds that they made have left many rumors in the legends of men. Thus, they came to Middle-earth, we are told, as lords and masters and gatherers of tribute. It is almost a certainty, in my opinion, that those three figures which would eventually become Ringwraiths came from this particular period in history and were Numenorians themselves. And we are further told by Tolkien that it is said that among those whom he enslaved with the Nine Rings, three were great lords of Numenorian race. So the Witch King, the leader of the Nine, would most probably have been one of these black Numenorean who came to conquer and settle on Middle-earth's shores. His status as captain of the Ringwraiths would most likely indicate a high-ranking status in his previous life, and a Numenorean would perhaps naturally succeed against any other lesser king or warrior from Middle-earth. It's fascinating to consider this small point in relation to the three ring rates being Numenorians. In Unfinished Tales, Christopher Tolkien writes, at the ford of Bruinen, only the Witch King and two others, with the lure of the ring straight before them, had dared the river. Could these three ring raids have dared to cross the elvish waters, precisely because they came from Numenor and were originally once men of the sea? I think it's a distinct possibility. Rune and Kand so, having established three ring rates coming from Numenor, in order for us to continue analyzing the remaining ring rates, it would be wise to tackle the only other Nazgul whose name has actually been given to us, Kamul, second to the chief, dwelt in Dol Guldur after its reoccupation in the Third Age, called the Shadow of the East, the Black Easterling. At first glance, it would be tempting to state that Kamul might have originated from Khand due to the similarity in the names Khand and Kamul. However, the quote from the index specifically mentions that he was a black easterling, a race of people who came out of the lands of Rune. It would be safe, therefore, to assume that this particular Ringwraith was originally a man of Rune, and just like the Black Numenorians, became influenced by the Dark Lord and eventually acquired one of the Rings of Power. So, having discarded Khand as a candidate for Kamul's origins, we still cannot overlook this location's relevance. Residing close to the land of Mordor, and having been its ally through the ages, it is highly plausible that a Ringwraith could have come from this land just southeast of Sauron's own realm. That brings the total of accounted Ringwraiths to five so far. Three Ringwraiths coming from Numenor, establishing themselves on the west coast of Middle-earth, and two more Nazgul from the east. 
strategic motives behind Sauron's choice. Now, if we were to take these speculations into account, it is interesting to see how Sauron employed a strategic move in order to ensure total dominion over Middle-earth. By the year 2251 of the Second Age, with the aid of his ring raids, Sauron would have had complete control over the eastern lands of Middle-earth via Rune and Kand and Mordor itself, of course. All this whilst three other of his servants could have been dwelling along the southwestern coasts. Sauron would have needed not only the ring raids themselves, but also entire peoples strongly under his dominion. Thus, between the years 1600 and 2251, those men who had in possession the Nine Rings would have established kingdoms of their own and controlled large followings of peoples. This can be confirmed over a thousand years later before the War of the Last Alliance, when Sauron gathered to him great strength of his servants out of the East and South, and among them were not a few of the high race of Numenor. The Matter of Herumor and Fuinor during the later part of the Second Age, we discover two individuals from the race of men, Herumor and Fuinor, who rose to power among the Haradrim. We are told that both of them came from Númenor and fell under the power of Sauron, when he was eventually captured by Arpharazon, the then king of Númenor. They later sailed east and established lordships in Harad, and many readers believe that these became two ring rates. However, as fascinating as this idea is, it must be emphasized that both of these men became black Numenorians well after the emergence of the ring rates. The timeline is there, it exists, and it clearly shows that this is the case and therefore they could not have been ring rates themselves. However, it is interesting why these two characters may have chosen the land of Harad, in which to establish their lordships. One can justly speculate that over 1,700 years before Herumor and Fuinor, two men, who would eventually become Nazgul, settled within this region of Harad, and would have established a following of sorts, thanks to their influence using the rings of power given to them by Sauron. And eventually, once Herumor and Fuinor would have established themselves within this region, they would have settled in and continued the cult that was previously established by the two ring rates. The king's folk established lordships in Umbar and Harad and in many other places on the coasts of the Great Lands. This particular quote refers to an event which took place between the years 2000 and 3000 of the Second Age, at least according to Tolkien's drafts. And this was a time when the Black Numenorians began to rise against the people of Middle-earth. Now, the word lordships here seems a strong indicator as to the origin of one or two ring rates. This would provide for a very strong reason and motive for the Haradrim, or at least a part of them, to become allies with Sauron during the War of the Ring. The remaining two ring rates. The final two sources from which the Nazgul could have originated are the regions of Eriador and the White Mountains. Both the original Easterlings, from the First Age who dwelt in the west of Middle-earth and came over into Beleriand, and the Men of the Mountains, seem to be eligible candidates. Of the people of Bor, it is said, came the most ancient of the men that dwelt in the north of Eriador, afterwards in the Second Age. Knowing that Eriador is soon to be conquered by Sauron, it would not be a far-fetched thought to ponder on the possibility that one of these ancient men fell under the Dark Lord's power and influence, and indeed acquired one of the Rings of Power. The other possibility may be situated among the Men of the Mountains, from whom came the Dunlendings and the Dead Men of Danharo. Originally, they dwelt in Minhiriath, south of Eriador, but after the Numenorean incursions in the Second Age, they scattered, some making their way towards Dunland in the east and the White Mountains further south. The denuding of the lands was increased during the war in Eriador, for the exiled natives welcomed Sauron and hoped for his victory over the men of the sea. Thus, even before being conquered by Sauron, many men living in those surrounding regions had already begun to fall under his influence. 
and this may be a possible link for the emergence of the ring rates from Eriador. As to the matter of the dead men in the White Mountains, could it be that later on in the Second Age, they intentionally refused Isildur's call to help during the War of the Last Alliance? Is it possible that by then they had been lured by the power of a ringwraith that rose among them when they had first settled there after their migration? And could it be that they eventually became the dead men who would ultimately redeem themselves by aiding Aragorn during the War of the Ring? Conclusions it may feel frustrating, I know. All this data, fragmentary details, speculations, theories, and we're still pretty much where we started off from. In this discussion, I have tried to stress the strategic importance in choosing specific regions of Middle-earth that would have aided Sauron's goal for dominion. Keeping in mind these speculations, three established ring rates from the west, four from the east and two more from the Eriador and Enedwaid regions would have provided the perfect opportunity to attack the free peoples from all directions. This is not to say that what happened in later years in favor of the Dark Lord was done in hindsight, but rather what he did during the early part of the Second Age indirectly affected the progress of the war against the races of Middle-earth. And with all this in mind, despite their literary power and allure, the Ringwraith's origins remain a mystery. As I said, this is just my opinion, and I'm really interested in hearing what your opinions are on this subject. And please do comment and debate in a friendly manner and discuss in the comments below. In the meantime, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, like, comment and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.